here. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Earth Day Everyday uh, presentation for tonight. Tonight, we're going to be learning about um, Rutgers Wildlife Wise Spring Babies Tips for Helping Injured or Orphaned Wildlife. And our speaker tonight is Kathleen Kerwin. So if I may, let me introduce Kathleen. Uh, Kathleen received an undergraduate degree in ecology, evolution, and natural resources from Rutgers University and a master's degree in ecology and evolution. She has a background in wildlife monitoring and management with projects experience actually um, throughout the United States. She joined the Wildlife Conservation and Management Program at Rutgers University in 2015. Her responsibilities include development and delivery of extension and education programming, program management, and delivery of extension services. Um, so if you would, Kathleen, if you could just advance to the next slide. Sure. <clears throat> there we go. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, later on, we're going to have a, um, a poll that will ask you about um, your evaluation of this program. But one question we're going to ask you um, is about if you will be willing to participate in a research project, which is just a survey um, about the programming we're giving. Um, so you, you absolutely do not need to agree to be part of this uh, research survey. Um, and just so you understand this, this kind of language that you see on the slide in front of you and asking you for participation is required by Rutgers. Um, so you'll see that poll um, later on. I think I think about about when we start talking about squirrels, <laughs> you'll see that that polling question. So you feel free to agree or, or not to agree to participate in the survey. Thank you. Oh, so I guess I should mention as well that um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And oh, I am I am Sal Mangifico. I also work for Rutgers. I'm going to be wrangling the questions tonight, and so we'll give them to Kathleen um, at the appropriate time for her to answer. Thanks. All right, thank you, Sal. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in, and we'll just get right into it. So before we talk about cute animals and spring time um, I did want to mention the winter um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the strategies that animals use to get through the winter time um, and we might be happy in winter because we don't see as many bugs around such as mosquitoes um, but mosquitoes and insects in general and green leafy vegetation um, these are the major food sources for a lot of wildlife um, so it makes sense that they're not breeding and having babies, well, they could be breeding, but they're not um, giving birth to babies in the winter time when there's really no food resources around. So the three main strategies that animals use to get through winter um, are pretty unique and interesting. So first we'll talk about torpor. Um, torpor is another word for hibernation or brumation, uh, which is what snakes um, or, or uh, lizards do, but they're all basically similar. So torpor is when um, animals are lowering their metabolism, um, sleeping for long periods, uh, lowering their body temperature, basically shutting down in order to save calories and, and, and reserve fat to get through this period where there's really no food resources for them. So the animals we think of doing this are bears, groundhogs, bats, chipmunks, uh, snakes, and amphibians. These are all animals that rely a lot on insects or berries or um, like grass or, or other vegetation that's just not around in the wintertime. Another strategy is just to migrate. So if you don't wanna uh, hibernate or you can't do that um, and there's no food, then you have to leave. You have to go to where the food is. Um, and many of the animals that migrate are, are songbirds. Um, these are also 
things that rely heavily on insects. Insects make up over 90% of their diet, uh, especially when they're breeding and they need more um, calories. So these guys all leave um, for the winter time. They go south where there's insects available all the time. And then the third strategy is just to tough it out. Um, so these are animals that we see all year round, doesn't matter what the season is. Uh, we have deer, fox, coyote, squirrels. Um, there's birds that just don't leave. Um, these are birds that survive off things like seeds and berries and insect larvae. So that would be like, you know, woodpeckers or nuthatches or um, blue jays. These are things that are fine um, surviving. One interesting fact is that some smaller birds like chickadees that don't leave for the winter, they, um, they hang out all year. They will go through really short periods of torpor, especially on really cold nights. They'll actually enter a state of torpor where everything slows down and their body temperature lowers just a little bit. And that helps them save calories so that they can get through the night um, and make it one more day. So there's all sorts of strategies that animals uh, use to get through the hard times. And then we get to spring, which is happening right now. We have warmer temperatures, longer days. Animals are either waking up or they're getting back from migration. And there's a lot of food. There's flowers, there's uh, vegetation coming back. All the insects are coming back. So this is a, a plentiful time and a good time to raise young. Um, but timing is everything. So depending on the animal, um, that's going to affect their life history strategy. So when they breed, when they give birth, um, for example, white-tailed deer, they're bigger mammals. So they have a, a relatively longer gestation period or pregnancy. Um, so they have to time their mating in the fall um, so that they, the does will be pregnant all winter and then give birth at the right time um, in the spring. Whereas something like a spotted salamander, and this is a photo I took just about a week and a half ago when there was that uh, warm rainy night, warm meaning it was above freezing, it was in the 40s, um, but that's all it took. These, these animals have been hibernating in leaf litter um, all winter long. They've just been waiting for those perfect conditions to wake up and they sprint down from their hibernating areas to these vernal pools, which are these shallow pools of water that are full um, in spring and summer. And they all lay eggs um, about the, the same time. So it's, um, it's interesting, but timing is everything because if you give birth to babies or lay eggs um, too soon, you risk them um, being cold, like if it's still cold in the early spring or it's not light out or there's not enough food resources. So you don't wanna give birth too early, but you also don't wanna to wait too long um, because if you wait too long, then there's not enough time for that animal to grow up and gain weight um, and get ready for winter time. So it's, it's, it's a challenge, but the number one rule, we're now gonna be talking about um, baby wildlife and, and when, or when we shouldn't intervene. The number one rule is that a lot of these wildlife species when they're young or newborns spend a lot of time alone. Um, that's just how they evolved. Um, they spend long periods alone while their parents are out feeding or doing other things. Um, so the general rule, if this is the only thing that you remember, um, if you come across a wild animal and it looks healthy and it looks okay, um, just leave it be. Just because it's alone doesn't mean it's orphaned or sick necessarily. Um, there's a lot of education campaigns out there by different government agencies and wildlife rehabilitators and just all sorts of um, agencies that are trying to get this message across because so many wild animals are brought into wildlife rehabs uh, kind of unnecessarily. Um, they are essentially just taken for no reason. People have good intentions, but um, there wasn't anything wrong with them. And a lot of these rehabbers are funded by, you know, donations. They have a very limited budget. Um, so it's hard on them. And it's also hard on the wildlife, which belong in the wild. So um, I think there's uh, just like a human um, nature to see some cute fuzzy animal and, and want to help it and, and want to do the right thing. Um, but it's good to remember that sometimes things are just best left alone. So good intentions can hurt. Uh, leave wildlife in the wild. And we're going to go over just specific examples of this and, and different types of animals. 
But when, so when does an animal need help? These are some general um, situations in which it is um, necessary to intervene or it's the right thing to do. Um, whether, the number one thing is that animal has been attacked by um, a dog or a cat. And either maybe you've seen this happen or it's obvious there's puncture wounds um, or maybe your cat is outside and, and brought you this animal. Um, that's a good time to intervene because the saliva in, um, from dogs and cats can cause some serious infections. So maybe the, the wound itself isn't that bad, but that animal is gonna be in danger of a serious um, issue just from the saliva. Um, if the animal is obviously injured, so a broken leg or it's bleeding, or maybe there's flies swarming around it, um, that's a bad sign. That It's a sign that it needs help. Maybe the parent is dead. So maybe you know, a, an adult deer that got hit by a car has a fawn with it and, and the fawn is still alive. Um, if you saw the animal is dead nearby, the, the, the parent, um, or a lot of times if wildlife are trapped, say like squirrels are in someone's attics and maybe, maybe the adults are trapped out um, and removed, but the babies are left behind, then those are now orphaned. So um, it has to be kind of like an obvious situation. Um, if the baby animal is wandering around all day, crying, upset, um, and you give it about 24 hours and the animal's still there, it's probably orphaned. Um, again, the parent has not clearly returned for over 24 hours. But again, just seeing the animal alone does not necessarily mean that it has been abandoned. Are there any questions before I move forward? Right. Yeah, we have a couple of questions, but I would say we can hold them for a bit. Okay. Kind of, they might be coming up. Okay. Uh, so we'll talk about songbirds first. And songbirds in general, um, so this is not including um, hawks or falcons or birds of prey or any sort of waterfowl. Um, these are birds that are most likely to be nesting in your backyard, maybe in a tree or a shrub. Most You're most likely to come encounter with them. Uh, but these birds develop very quickly. Once they hatch out of the egg, they are um, flying away in a very short period of time, just a few weeks. So the first thing to do, if you do come across, um, say a bird that fell out of the nest or, or you're not sure what to do, um, the first thing to do is determine the age of the bird. So with songbirds, they have three age classes. Um, there's hatchling. So that's essentially a newborn baby songbird. They just hatched out of the egg. They're probably one, two, or three days old. Um, they are naked. They don't have any feathers on them. They might have a little down, like wispy down, um, like fluffy stuff on them. And those are birds that should be in the nest. Um, if you find them out of the nest, that's, that's an issue. Uh, and I, I should mention, these are pictures I took uh, for a, a tree swallow nest project that we have. Uh, we monitor six nest boxes on a restoration site in South Jersey. So it's a lot of fun because once a week you get to check in on the birds and, and see them grow. Um, the next stage is this middle picture. So it's kind of hard to see, but that, there's like four or five birds in that middle picture. Um, these are nestlings. So they're over three days old, but under two weeks old. And at this stage, their eyes open up. Um, they're starting to grow feathers, which when these feathers emerge at first, they're in this protective sheath. So it almost looks like tubes coming out of their body. It's kind of strange. Uh, but these sheaths will break away and feathers will emerge. These are also um, an age class. When, they're, when they are in this age class, they should be in the nest. And then the next stage is called fledgling. And fledglings are at least two weeks old, they're fully feathered, um, their tails might be short and they might not look totally like adults yet, but they are starting to become more independent. They're trying to learn how to fly. So in order to do this, you know, they can't just go from sitting still to flying. They have to practice and gain some strength. So they'll start walking, they'll, they'll leave the nest on their own and they'll walk and they'll hop and they'll flutter around and they, they can actually climb a little bit. Um, so if, if you see a fledgling either on a shrub or maybe on the ground, um, it's probably completely fine. Um, its parents will stick near by it for a while and they'll still care for it, still give it food. 
um, until it does learn how to fly and then they'll kick it out. But um, these birds, it's okay if you, if you do see them outside of the nest. Here's just another graphic showing uh, examples. So again, hatchling at the top left, the fuzzy, weird looking alien, kind of cute. Um, then they become these nestlings. So they're just growing their feathers in, their eyes are open and then um, fledgling. So fully feathered, they still have that kind of wispy down uh, present um, and they, they look young, but um, they're starting to grow up. So if you do find say a hatchling or a nestling, so a bird that's under two weeks old and say you find it on the ground, that's not good. That bird should not be on the ground. Um, it needs to be back in its nest. In a perfect situation, you look up and the nest is right there and you can reach it. Um, it is totally fine to pick up that baby bird and put it right back where it came from. Um, and, you know, as long as your hands are relatively clean, there's not, you know, no greasy stuff on them or anything, it's okay to touch it. Um, it's a myth that adult birds will reject their babies if you touch them. Uh, they, songbirds in general can't smell that well, so it's really not going to bother them. Um, but if there's no nest, either it fell out of the tree or it's way too high to reach safely, um, what you can do is actually build a nest for them. And a lot of times the adult bird will actually use the new nest. Um, so the best thing to do is take a wicker basket. This is good because they're not watertight. So if it rains, uh, the water can flow right through the bottom of the basket. Um, make sure the sides are not more than four inches. Line it with something nice, uh, secure it to a tree. Um, nice meaning some grass or something soft uh, and put the birds back in. And then try and monitor from a distance for about a day to see if the parents are actually coming back or not. If you find a fledgling, so those awkward teenager birds, uh, just leave them alone. Um, if there's no immediate danger, they're totally fine. If there is a danger, say it's in your backyard and your golden retriever is, is running around, uh, just pick it up and put it in a nearby tree. It'll figure things out. Um, there's really no need to do anything else. Um, it is illegal to raise baby birds, and most will die if you try to raise them. Um, they're best left with their parents, um, if at all possible. Signs of illness um, or injury, you might be thinking, well, how do I know if the bird is like healthy or not? Um, things to look for are dirty or matted or missing feathers. Um, so if they have like dried poop on them or they're just generally like not looking very clean, um, if they have like a visible injury, so again, broken leg or maybe um, some puncture wounds, they're bleeding, if they have swollen eyes, um, if they're really still, even when you come up to them and they don't move at all, um, that's not a good sign. If they can't fly and it's an adult, um, that's also not good or difficulty breathing. I should add here that um, a lot of adult birds, especially in the summer, um, they fly into windows. It's called window strikes. They can't see. Um, they're, they're seeing a reflection, they, they, they have no idea it's a window. Um, so they will fly full speed into a window and kind of knock themselves out. Um, if that happens and you see an adult bird laying you know, by your window and it's, it's still alive, um, put it in a safe place. Sometimes they just need a few minutes to kind of shake things off. Um, I've seen it happen where it's, a bird's been completely stunned and then kind of shake it off and then fly off and, and it, it seemed to be okay. Um, but just something to look out for during in the summertime. So how to help if you do find an uh, orphan or injured bird of any age. Um, the thing to do is to put it in a container. So a shoe box works really well or, or some other cardboard box or, or tote, um, you know, plastic bin. Uh, put some sort of soft material such as a shirt or an old, old uh, clean rag. Uh, put a heating pad under it, but set it to low. You don't want it too hot. Um, don't give it food or water. Um, sometimes that can do more harm than good. So you know, most rehabbers will say just don't feed it anything and try and contact a wildlife rehab as soon as you can um, to get that bird some help. Uh, all right, we're going to talk about mammals now. So if there's any bird questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Um, okay, yeah, why don't we handle a couple couple bird questions. Okay. Um, not a songbird, 
but is it normal for swans to stay around in the winter or do they normally uh, migrate? Um, good question. So we have a few swan species. Um, so our mute swans are here, I'm pretty sure all year round. Um, they're actually a species from Europe. So they can actually cause some issues. They're considered invasive, at least in my mind. Um, they're very territorial. Um, it can cause issues with some native breeding birds. Um, they're around, I'm pretty sure, all year. And then there's other rarer swans that I'm, I think are only here in the winter time. I think they breed like in the Arctic or, or somewhere <coughs> farther north. But we do have breeding swans here, the uh, mute swan. Okay, and those stay around all year. The, the moot swans? Yeah, almost yeah. positive. <laughs> um, there were a couple comments about um, how useful the information is because uh, we used to we used to rescue baby birds um, when we were kids, and apparently that was really unnecessary and probably <laughs> not the best thing to be doing. Yeah. Um, one other question from Leanne. Let me see if I can summarize this. Um, there was a bird nested in a Christmas wreath. Um, mm. And when they opened the door, some of the eggs fell out and broke. Mm. Um, and then later on, the nest was destroyed. Um, so do you think the birds had destroyed the nest and the other eggs? Or did something else happen? Yeah, that's hard to say. Um... So my, with my experience with the nest box and the tree swallows, it's crazy the things that happen. So like, you know, in, in, a, in a normal situation, you know, the eggs are laid and then they, they hatch and everything's okay. But sometimes we'll find the eggs have been smashed and we can only assume that um, a lot of these birds are really territorial. So if they're fighting over a nesting space, they'll actually like take eggs out from the nest um, if they're like a competing pair trying to use that box or that nest space. So it could have been another bird. Um, and then a lot of times they'll like start making a new nest on top of the old one. So yeah, it's, it's hard to say what happened, but maybe it was another a bird that had actually done that. Hmm. But, yeah, who knows? Yeah, for, for the final bird question, um, and this is related and also kind of the question I had, which is, um, oh, no, we got one more bird question after this. Um, but birds flying into the window, what can you do about that? And yeah. it's, it's my question because at our office right now, we have a cardinal that is going after all the windows. I think he's learning, <laughs> not smashing into them as much and just kind of sitting there and pecking at them a little bit, but. Yeah, that's a great question. So. There are, um, there's things you can buy that you can put on the window, like those like sticky. Um, the like, silhouettes. Of yeah, a bird. they're like silhouettes and they could be different shapes and they can be like decorative so that they look nice. Um, but it just, it helps the bird realize that there's something there and they don't just smash head onto it. Um, it's like a, it's a huge problem though. And I know, I, be I believe, there's a certain type of glass um, that, especially with like commercial buildings, like new buildings coming up, there's a lot of push for them to start using this like, type of window that the birds can see because so many birds are flying into skyscrapers and the like, commercial buildings and just falling dead. Right. Um, but yeah, it, that'd be a good thing to look up. I, I believe there's like pretty simple solutions in terms of just like putting those like sticky things on the window and just helping the birds to realize that's not a good place to fly. Yeah, for, for the Cardinal at our office, the bird silhouettes did not mm -hmm. work, but mm -hmm. I literally just put up like plastic, like white plastic over the whole windows. Yeah. Which works, but now he's going to the other windows. <laughs> so he's, he's trying to have a big territory. Okay, last bird question. Um, Okay, um, active active geese in central Jersey. Not sure when their when their eggs will hatch. Is there really a fine if you hit one with your car? <laughs> so there might um, be a few few questions in there. Uh, in terms of the geese hatching, uh, probably 
closer to May, I would imagine, or maybe even April. I'm not totally sure on that one. Um, seems a little early now, but I could be wrong. Uh, it's not legal to aim for geese with your car, I don't think. I mean, accidents happen. I see roadkill geese a lot of the time um, driving around, but yeah, they're not, you're not allowed to purposefully hit them. Okay. And they are considered migratory birds, right? So right. They're, they're protected under that. They are, but in New Jersey, there is a population that doesn't migrate anymore. They just hang out all year because there's no reason for them to leave because they've just adapted to golf courses and other places where there's plenty of food for them. Um, so, but I believe they're still protected. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on to mammals. We're gonna start with bats because they fly like birds, but uh, they are not related to birds, they are mammals. Um, and we study bats a lot uh, with our, our program that I'm in. Um, so I like bats and I could talk about bats all day, but I've limited, limited this to two slides. If anyone has questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Um, but baby bats are called pups. And uh, typically bats will give birth to one or two pups uh, in May or June. And some of our species will form colonies. They're called maternity colonies. So a bunch of female bats will get together and they'll all give birth around the same time. Um, and that's the type of bat that we try and attract into something like a bat house, um, or that's the type of bat you would find in an attic space or living in your garage or barn or something like that. Um, so when pups are born, they can't fly for up to four weeks. It takes about a month for them to figure out how to fly. They're born pretty helpless. So here's a picture of one. Um, they're like naked and blind and, and they can't do much. Um, so the sad part is that if a bat happens to fall, uh, a baby bat, um, it'll fall into the ground and quickly become dehydrated and, and it's not going to make it. And the mother bats can't pick up those pups. Um, they can't, they don't have the ability to pick something up and fly off with it. So um, if you do have, say, a bat house or you know that there's bats living, you know, somewhere, maybe in your garage or something, um, and you, you're okay with that, and you, you see a baby bat maybe on the ground, um, you can assume that it fell from straight up above. And if you're able to safely put that bat right back where it came from, um, it's kind of similar to a bird. If you see a baby bird on the ground, just put it right back in the nest. Um, that's the best thing to do. Um, just take, put on gloves, pick up the baby bat, and then hold it upside down. And its, its feet will just instinctually start like looking for something to grasp onto. So you can usually just perch it up on, onto something. Um, and then if, if the bat is obviously injured or um, not looking too good, then that would be a time to call a rehabber. Um, I added this in for... Um, mostly for adult bats, but if, if you do see a bat in your house, um, it's, it can be very alarming, uh, but try not to panic. Um, most likely it is a juvenile. So I, I get a lot of calls in late, like later in the summer from this happening and people have a bat flying around. Um, it's probably a young bat that just learned how to fly. And at that point they look identical to an adult bat. Um, and they probably took a wrong turn and they don't want to be in your house just as much as you don't want them in your house. Um, so the best thing to do is go into the room where the bat is. If it's flying around, um, open whatever door or window that leads to the outside, um, turn off the lights and actually stay in the room with the bat to make sure that it leaves. It's not going to attack you. You're not going to get rabies just from being in the same room with it. Um, just try and, and, and watch it as it leaves. Um, otherwise it could possibly land somewhere and crawl into a little crack or crevice and you might not see it and it could die because it's going to get dehydrated. If the bat lands somewhere and doesn't want to fly anymore, um, I found this graphic, which is, I think, really helpful. Um, so the best thing to do, put on gloves, um, put, get some sort of box, like a shoe box, put it over the bat and quickly, and then 
can have some sort of cardboard or rigid flat thing that you can slide um, on, you know, against the wall and kind of gently get the bat uh, between that piece and, and the box. And then, then it's trapped in that box. You can just go outside and let it go. Um, and that works perfectly. Um, any back questions before I move on? Those can stir up some questions. Okay, you got one question. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, if you see something flying at night, is it most likely a bird or a bat? Good question. It's most likely a bat. Um, and if it doesn't matter where you live, bats are like everywhere. So if you in the summertime go outside it's actually kind of cool um as the sun goes down and it becomes dusk you can actually hear the birds chirping and they will start to get quieter and quieter and as that's happening pay attention because you'll start seeing bats fly around so they're, they're pretty separated i mean you could be seeing an owl or something like that but if it's small and flying it's almost um definitely a bat um, they, they're both eating insects, like a lot of birds are eating insects out of the air, bats are eating insects out of the air. Birds fly a lot better than bats do, so they, bats don't want to compete with birds. They'll wait till the birds go to sleep, and then they'll come out and start flying around. Um, but yeah, you can definitely, if, you can def definitely assume it's a bat if it's, if it's nighttime. Is that it? Yep. Okay. Okay, moving on to rabbits. So rabbits are um, kind of different. So I, I said before that um, animals will oftentimes like have one chance to give birth and they have to time it right. Well, rabbits will give birth to multiple litters uh, throughout the summertime, up to three to four. That's because they are a prey species. So a lot of things are trying to eat them. Um, so their strategy is to have as many babies as possible in the spring and summertime, because not that many of them will actually survive to adulthood. So they're just trying to have as many as possible. Um, these rabbits, are the, they're called kits. So baby rabbits are called kits. Um, they grow up very quickly. Uh, within two to three weeks, baby bunnies are off on their own um, and they are ready to go. So rabbits are, are kind of cool. They, they don't live in burrows. They don't live underground. Um, their nests are simply just a little bit of a, um, a dugout depression in the ground. It doesn't have to be deep. Um, and they will cover that with fur that they pull off their own chests and, and, and some dried grass. Um, and they will have their babies right there. So this is really important because rabbits are probably one of the most frequently brought in species uh, to a wildlife rehab, but they, the mother rabbit will spend almost zero time at the nest. And that's because they are a prey species. So they don't want to draw any attention um, to that nesting spot because so many things will eat those babies. Um, so what they do is that at dusk and at dawn, they'll sneak up to the nest and they'll straddle the nest, just like in this picture. And then the babies will stick their little heads out um, and feed from the mom. And then she'll go off and she won't go back the entire day. Um, so it's really, it's interesting, but yeah, a lot of people that find this nest are like, oh, there, there's no mom around. Just assume they're abandoned, but that's not true. So just general rules with baby rabbits. If they are about the size of a tennis ball, and their eyes are open and their ears are up and they're looking alert, they are good to go. There's no reason to, to take them um, if they're looking healthy. Um, at that size, they're fine to be on their own. If you have a suspicion that a nest really is abandoned or, or something maybe isn't right, um, there's a really simple test that you can do. So go up to the nest and put an X shape on top of it using yarn or some sticks or whatever you have lying around, um, you know, something light. And if that X shape that you make is not disturbed in over 24 hours, then you know that the mom hasn't come back for them. 
If it is disturbed, then you can assume that she's been back to feed. Um, but it happens quickly. So you might, you know, you might be staring at them all day and you, and you look away and you're going to miss her coming back. So this is a good way to test if there is a parent coming back. If you do find a nest in your backyard, um, try to keep your pets away from it. Maybe like put some, um, I'm not sure. Try and keep your pets if you, if you can. Um, don't try not to mow within 10 feet um, if possible, just to give them space. I mean, they're going to be out of there in two to three weeks. So it's not that um, long of a time. If, um, if any of these situations happen, then it's a good idea to help that baby rabbit. If it's if you find one out of the nest and it's bleeding or has some sort of injury, um, clearly something has happened to it. If your dog or cat bring it home, that's an issue. Um, if you find one that's wet and shivering, um, try to handle them as little as possible. They are so easily stressed out. They'll, they can actually die from a heart attack just from you holding them. Um, so the less you handle them, the better. Um, all right, moving on to white tail deer. These are called fawns. So they're born in April to July, but the majority of them are born in June. Um, and often they can just be single babies, twins, or triplets, which is common in New Jersey because we have so many resources for deer. Um, deer are very happy in New Jersey. There's a lot of them um, and they're very fertile. So it's, it's common to see a mom with actually three babies, which is kind of crazy. Um, they are kind of similar to rabbits in the sense that um, the fawn can be left alone by the mom for long periods of time, especially in the first week. A newborn fawn um, isn't going to really move much, um, so their defense strategy is just going to be to stay really still. So if you see a fawn or maybe you don't see it, you're walking through the grass and all of a sudden there's a fawn right in front of you and it's like a newborn, um, they're not going to move. They're just going to sit there. Um, so that doesn't mean it's abandoned. Um, they, they, you know, they can't really walk around too good yet. So the, the doe, the doe will go off on her own to feed, um, and we'll come back for it, especially at night. Um, so if you see one like that, just leave it alone. Um, when to help a fawn. So again, if it appears sick, injured, it's crying nonstop. Um, it seems weak. Um, or maybe if you see one, but it's in a really dangerous situation, maybe it's close to a busy road, um, you know that there's dogs around, um, it's okay to move that fawn somewhere nearby, but maybe a little safer. Um, just move it, leave it be. Um, the mom will come back once there's no people around, um, probably at night. Come back and check after 24 hours. If it's still there, clearly hasn't been taken care of, um, then it's a time to intervene. If you do think a, a fawn needs assistance, contact a rehabber. Not all of them take deer, um, but um, I'll send a list at the end that it tells you um, which rehabber takes which types of animals. Um, so there's a lot of campaigns about this. Don't be a fawn napper, um, like a kidnapper. But again, just seeing an animal alone, especially a fawn, does not mean it's orphaned. Just leave them be. Squirrels. Um, so baby squirrels are called kits. Um, they are also some similar to rabbits in that they produce uh, more than one litter. Um, their um, breedings are a little more timed out, whereas rabbits will just breed as many times as they can. Um, so the squirrels will have a first breeding event um, in the winter and they'll give birth right about now. Um, and then as long as there's enough food and resources, they will get um, a second um, litter in during the summertime. And with each litter, there's three to four, sorry, I said pups, I should have said kits, um, but there's three to four kits per litter. And the mother squirrel um, will retrieve infant squirrels that may have gotten out of the nest. Maybe they fell or they just wandered away. She will come out and retrieve them. So if you do see a squirrel, a uh, baby squirrel that looks like it might need some help, just leave it be, watch from inside, see if the mom comes and gets it. And just try and keep pets and people away. But they're born very um, small and naked and uh, eventually they get furred and they're very cute. 
Um, but um, yeah, they're, they're mom, with squirrels, uh, the moms will retrieve them if given the chance. Um, here's the new vocab word of the day. Oh, there's the poll. Um, it's called yeah. a brick. Oh, sorry. Yeah, if I could just interrupt. Yeah, yeah I, did sure. launch, I did launch the poll. Um, so if people wouldn't mind filling that out, that would be appreciated. Uh, there was a question about consenting just to be part of the survey. Uh, there's a couple of questions about the overall instruction and teaching and program content. And then if you notice questions four, five, six, seven, are, um, they're kind of set up as before and after, how much I knew about the question. And then question eight has some specific things you might do um, after learning about this topic. Okay, thanks. Cool, thanks. So new vocab word of the day is dre. I just recently learned this and I really like it, but that's, that's the technical term for a squirrel nest. Um, so squirrels will make these big nests with sticks and leaves and they're like really obvious. Um, if, if you look up in a tree and see this like big pile of leaves, it's probably a dre, a squirrel nest. Um, you know, mo most birds are not building nests this big. And so when to help um, a squirrel? Well, if you see one maybe like this on the bottom left, um, if it's injured, if again, if it was in the mouth of a dog or a cat, um, sometimes if a tree fall, falls over, or it was cut down and it had a squirrel nest in it, um, that's a good time to intervene because that, uh, that nest was destroyed. Um, if you know that the mother was removed or killed, so in like a trapping situation, if they were living in an attic and the mom was taken out, um, then those, those babies would be orphaned. Red fox, striped skunks, and raccoons. I, I lump them all together because they have uh, similar life histories. Uh, they're all called kits, the, the babies of, of those animals. They all breed in the winter time and then give birth um, in the early spring. And their litter sizes uh, are, are a little variable, but with fox, it could be three to seven, raccoons two to five, and skunks two to 12. That's kind of high for skunks. I was a little surprised by that. Um, but skunks and fox will make dens. So burrows in the ground or rock crevices, um, they'll form a den. And that's what, where they will raise their young. Raccoons will make nests. So in tree cavities or um, in various different places, they will, they will make a nest. Uh, this middle picture I got from Woodlands Wildlife Refuge where I interned many, many years ago. Uh, but they posted this picture and kind of uh, asked the audience, what, what animal do you think this is? Uh, and there was all sorts of answers like coyote and, and lots of different things. But um, this is actually a baby red fox. They, they can be really dark when they're younger um, and a little, um, it's like hard to tell it's a fox, but yeah, they're pretty cute. So one to help, um, these animals, can get very curious. And if their moms leave them in the nest or the den, and as they get older, they can start to uh, wander out and explore a little bit on their own. And it's possible that they get um, you know, lost or they slip out of the tree or something happens. Um, but the parents of these animals are pretty um, good at taking the animals back. They will try very hard to find their lost baby um, so if, if this happens and say you see like a raccoon that's alone and something's not right, um, it could be that the mom is just waiting for the night to come back, come back and get it. So the best thing to do is just put them somewhere safe, leave them be, again, give them 24 hours. That's like the general rule for all of these wildlife species. If they're still there after a day and clearly haven't been tended to, um, that's when you can assume that they've been orphaned. But many times um, the mom will come back and, and retrieve them and, and take them. Possums, these are some of my favorite animals. They're so cool. They are only marsupial in North America, meaning that they have a pouch where they carry their young. Um, the, young are call, the young are born extremely underdeveloped. 
Um, and when they're born, they have these like really big hands and they use their hands to claw their way up into the pouch where they then continue developing um, until they're old enough to explore out of the pouch. But the young are called joeys. Um, if you find one that's at least seven inches long, not including the tail, and it's not injured, it's totally fine to be on its own. Um, they can be pretty in independent by, th by that size. But before that, they like to really hang out with mom um, and ride on her back and be really cute. Sorry if this is a, a little sad, but um, one thing to think about, especially in spring and summer, is that uh, possums get hit by cars a lot. And if it's a female possum, it's, it could be that she has young in her pouch. Um, so a good thing to do if it's safe to do so, um, if you know that a possum just got hit by a car um, and, you, and you're able to pull over and check, um, you know, wear gloves and just do a really quick check this is where the pouch is located. Here's a nice picture. Um, and see if there's live babies, because if there are, um, they're gonna need help. And so the, the thing to do is get a box and put the whole possum with babies in the pouch. Don't take them out. Um, just put the whole thing in a box and bring it to a rehabber as soon as you can, because they are gonna need help like really quickly. Uh, but a lot of baby possums die this way. Um, so it's just something to think about. Okay, we're gonna end with turtles. I wanted to mention turtles crossing the road. So again, only do this if it's safe to do so. Um, if you're able to safely pull over and see traffic coming from both directions. Um, but if you see a turtle that's in the middle of the road, um, the, it, it might need help. Um, usually they're crossing a road because they're trying to get somewhere very specific. Usually trying to get to a water source so if no cars are coming, um, if, if it's like really no cars are coming, like you're in the middle of nowhere, um, the best thing is to just park and, and watch it and make sure it gets across safely. Um, if you don't have that kind of time, go over, grab that turtle by the back, uh, the sides of the shell, pick it up and bring it in the direction it was going. That's really important. Don't put it back to where it came from. You know, as long as it's safely possible, put it in the direction it was going because it was going there for a reason. A lot of turtles get hit by cars every year. Um, so it always feels good to help one cross the road. Here's me with a snapping turtle. So snapping turtles are scary, but the safe way to hold them where they can't get you is at the base of the shell. Um, so I have two, two instances here, but if you hold them at the base of the shell like that, they can't reach around and bite you um, and they can't get their claws up to scratch you. Um, they're really heavy if they're big like that, um, but if, you're, if you feel comfortable doing so, um, this is the appropriate way to handle a snapping turtle. Well, some people grab them by their tails, and that's really, really bad for the snapping turtle. Don't ever grab really anything by its tail. Um, but yeah, that's the appropriate way and the safe way to do that. We get a few calls every um, spring about snapping turtles in people's gardens. So snapping turtles are, are definitely scary because they can bite you and cause some harm. Um, but if you see one in your backyard, really the only reason you would ever see one in your backyard is it's a female trying to nest. They spend all of their lives in the water. So the only time you would see them out is for nesting. Um, and females will pick a spot that she thinks is appropriate um, and she will dig a shallow nest and she will lay 15 to 50 eggs that basically look just like ping pong balls. Um, so we get questions on like what, you know, what, what people should do, if they should move the nest or, or what. Um, best thing is to just leave it be. Um, if you do actually see her in the act of, of laying eggs, um, try and keep, you know, people and, and pets away, let her do her thing. Um, and then when she's done, just leave it be if possible. Um, she picked that spot for a reason and there's no way, um, I mean, there, there's no reason for her to come back. Once she's done laying those eggs, she's going back to the water and she has no part in raising those babies. They're gonna hatch out of the egg. They're really small and they're really cute. Um, and they will, those babies will then beeline to the water as well. So there's no, you don't have to be scared that, you know, all these turtles are gonna be 
coming in your yard all the time. It's just like a one-time thing. So just to recap, um, general rules for helping an orphaned or injured animal. Um, these rules really apply to any species. Um, get the animal into a safe container. Always wear gloves. Um, any mammal species can carry rabies, so um, it's really important to wear gloves. Um, line that box or container with an old t-shirt or soft cloth. Um, do not give food or water in most cases unless a rehabber tells you otherwise. Uh, place that container in a warm, dark, quiet place. Try not to stress it out. Not, don't have loud music or people screaming. Um, and then transport that animal as quickly as you can to someone that can help. Um, and in the state of New Jersey, we have a list of licensed um, wildlife rehabilitators. It's really easy to find online if you just Google uh, NJ Wildlife Rehab. Um, the, a list will pop up. Here's the link to it. Um, because of COVID, this is just a screenshot I took from that list. Um, because of COVID, it's important to call ahead of time, um, just in case, you know, they're not operating right now or they might have a, a short, um, not as many staff. Um, so this is a good list. It, it, it tells you all the rehabbers, uh, where they're located and what animals that they will accept. Um, so it, it's really useful to have. And that's it. I'm gonna make a plug for our Facebook page. Please like us on Facebook. We post a lot of fun stuff about wildlife. And yeah, I'll, I'd be happy to answer more questions. Yep, we got a few more questions. I'm gonna turn my light on really quick. Yeah, and I can, I can turn my camera on, I think. Okay, jumping back to squirrels. Um, so the question was asked, if, if there's a tree that needs to be taken down and could have squirrels nests in it, and, and maybe other things like woodpeckers, mm -hmm. um, what's, the, what's the right time to take that tree down? Yeah, great question. Um, the best time would be in the fall or the winter, um, because especially with bats that could be using the tree or squirrels or, or yeah, anything, you want to avoid the, the the season where there's babies, um, because in the fall and winter, those babies you can assume are going to be adults, and that, or if they're bats, they can fly, um, and they'll be able to escape if if the tree starts to get um, taken down. So yeah, just avoid the time when there's young things around. Um, here's a good one from Ed. How do you know if the possum is dead or playing dead? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Um, I would probably try and get near it and if it was like a stick or something, like give it a little poke. Um, possums are generally like pretty harmless. Like they put on a show, they'll hiss at you and they, they look like scary um, and they'll, they'll do the playing dead thing. Um, but they're, the odds of them attacking are, are very, very, very low. Um, so yeah, usually it's like pretty obvious if something's got hit by a car, it's gonna be probably in, you know, bloody or, or just on the side of the road, but that's a good question. Okay, um, you, you listed some of the, well, you listed the site for the, the, the rehabs, um, but are they, in general, are they open 24 hours a day? It depends, um, usually not. Uh, a lot of these rehabs are run by um, just a few people and they don't have that many resources. Um, there's some exceptions like Mercer County Wildlife Rehab. Um, they're actually run by the, the, the county. Um, so they do get some like government um, funding and they have like more staff. Uh, but I think in general, they're not open uh, during the nighttime. Um, so yeah, it, it can be difficult to find help like during those hours, but just hold on to the animal till the morning time and then and then try and call. Okay, here's a more philosophical question. Um, if you find if you find an injured animal or or a baby animal, is it fine to just leave them be and let nature take its course? 
That's a great question. And I've thought about this a lot. Um, so the way I, this is my opinion and uh, people might disagree, um, but I totally agree that nature should take its course. Um, the times where I think it's appropriate to intervene is when it was a human caused issue. So squirrels were trapped out of an attic or it was you know, injured by a cat or a dog, which is really not natural. Those are people's pets. Um, you know, if it was roadkill or, or injured by a car, those are the situations where I feel like it's our duty to intervene because it's not natural. It's, it's like so human, um, you know, there's been a lot of like human influence, but um, yeah, it's kind of a personal thing. Cause you're right. If you do leave an injured animal, it's probably going to feed something else that needs to eat, you know, hawks and predators, they all need to feed their families. So it's, it is a, it's a good question to think about, but that's kind of how I, I go about it. Okay. Um, why, why do deer feed so much next to the roadsides, even though it's dangerous? Um, that's a great question. So deer are what we call edge species. So they really, really, really like those types of habitats where there might be like a tree line and then some mowed area. And that is often found next to a highway um, where you know people keep, keep that um, strip of grass mowed. So that's the type of habitat that they like. They'll feed in that grassy spot, but then they have the trees for cover um, if they need it. So I think it's just a matter of it's habitat they, that they prefer um even though it's so dangerous um i don't know yeah they still do it <laughs> and then i guess it's not a huge issue until it's the breeding season when they lose all sense of anything and that's when accidents happen all the time mm -hmm. we do have a few more mm -hmm. Um, there was a comment that somebody moved a snapping turtle in a trash can, which made it rather easy and less dangerous. Nice. Um, if there's squirrels being born, say in the spring, how do you know when they're out of the nest? Um, I'm not sure I understand. Or how, well, I guess how, how, how long are the babies hanging out in the nest? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think they grow up pretty quick. I, I would imagine a few weeks, but I didn't actually look into that. Do squirrels use the nest or the, um, I forget the word used for that. But the squirrel nest, the <laughs> dre, do they use the dre all year? Uh, I believe so, they'll use it uh, during the winter. Um, so they're nesting in there at night in the winter? Yeah, and I, I've seen, um, I've seen them not make those big nests. Like I've seen young squirrels emerge from tree cavities or things like that in the winter time where they're more protected. Um, but I believe they are in there um, keeping warm. There's a question about what deer eat. Do they eat mostly grass or do they eat other things? Deer eat all sorts of vegetation, um, but yes, grass, they'll eat berries, um, fruit, um, they'll, yeah, they'll eat whatever vegetation they can get their hands on. Um, there's some evidence or anecdotal incidents of deer eating baby birds, which is not common, but um, I guess if they're desperate or need some more protein. Um, but yeah, mostly vegetation. Are there, are there any plants that are around in the winter that they tend to eat? Like I've heard like poison ivy. I don't know if that's true. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I think they'll, they'll, re they'll eat really anything, especially if, if like food sources are lowered. Um, I've seen them eat like all sorts of shrubs and um, deciduous and coniferous. Like they'll, if they are hungry, they will eat whatever plant they can find. Like there's really no such thing as a deer. You can get deer resistant plants, but a hungry deer is gonna eat anything.
Um, okay, there's a question. Should we help an injured mother rabbit? Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you know what happened to it or um, I'm assuming you, if that's a case where you knew it had a nest somewhere, um, that can be tricky because if you remove the, the mother, then the, the babies would then be orphaned. So um, I, I guess if you did decide to help the mother, just make sure that you also, um, if you knew exactly where that nest was, that just make sure to keep an eye on those rabbits. If they're too young, they would also need to be taken to a rehabber. Um, there's a couple of questions about, so um, if you see an animal displaying bizarre behavior, like running in circles, should you assume that it's rabid? Good question. Um, rabies can definitely make animals act strange. Um, and rabies is so dangerous that if you do see odd behavior, um, you can't assume it's rabies, but you wanna be cautious. So if an animal is acting strange like that, um, I would call the police or animal control to take a look at the situation. Um, you know, don't handle that animal yourself, but um, yeah, that can be tough. If it is acting strange in that way, um, you, you know, it could have an injury, but it could also be sick with something like rabies. It's just hard to know. Okay, and then kind of maybe a, a kind of related question is, if you do find a dead animal, um, maybe something small like a, like a mouse or something, should you assume that it's poisoned in some way and get rid of it, throw it in the trash rather than leave it for something to eat? Yeah. Or maybe, maybe you've had rabies or something. Yeah, it's good. S small animals don't, aren't really known to carry um, rabies. Like they, I guess technically they can't, they can, but um, I, I, I would just leave it. I mean, unless you knew, unless you were setting out the poison or you knew that your neighbors were, um, you know, they, they can die from all sorts of different things. So I would, I would probably leave it if it was me, unless you knew it could be poison, then yes, I would, you know, remove it so that no other like bird or other animals eating it. Okay. Um, maybe we have just a couple more. So um, do squirrels use the nest from year to year? Um, I don't know enough about squirrels, I'm, I'm realizing, but I, I would think so. I mean, I, I've seen nests in the in, in trees near near me for that seem to be active um, year after year. So I would think so. Okay, there's a question about doves that were nesting in a walnut tree. Mm -hmm. No, I got this wrong. There were dev, doves nesting in the backyard and a walnut fell in their nest, do you think they're okay? I don't know. I mean, if it fell directly on it, probably they're not okay. <laughs> um, hopefully they're okay, but if you could get a better look. Um, morning doves, I think nest in all sorts of places. I got a photo last year of a morning dove that nested in someone's like construction workshop. So I think they're pretty adaptable, but hopefully they're okay. Um, there's a question about how, how would you dispose of dead animals? Um, again, I would not, I would, most cases I'd like let it be and just let other things eat it or let it decompose. Um, if you had to remove it, um, just plastic bags, that would be my go-to. Maybe double bag it so it doesn't smell. <laughs> okay. And just throw it out. I mean, if it's small, it's easy to throw out. If it was really big, it'd be more challenging. Um, can you say anything about the disease that's affecting deer? Um, yeah, chronic wasting disease. It's really scary. Um, there is no evidence that it is in New Jersey. Um, I actually just a few months ago um, asked the state veterinarian about this um, and she tests deer all the time for it. 
um, and, and there's no evidence that it's here. Um, it's a, a prion or prion disease, so similar to mad cow disease, um, where it goes into their brain and, and it's fatal, it's 100% fatal. There's no evidence of chronic wasting disease um, transferring to humans, um, but the current recommendation um, that I'm aware of is that you shouldn't eat meat that is known to be positive with chronic wasting disease, um, even though the threat of it jumping into humans is so small, but it's 100% fatal if it does. So we have to be really careful um, and really hoping it doesn't make a jump to New Jersey because that would be sad. But um, unfortunately, it's just, it's spreading and um, especially out West, it's a scary thing. Okay. Um, and, and feel free to cut us off from questions when you're ready. They seem to be, <laughs> they seem to be multiplying like, like rabbits. <laughs> That's fine. Um, do robins reuse a nest year after year? I don't know. Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know the answer. I know with our nest boxes, um, with the tree swallows, we go in the early, early spring and clean them out. So we take out all that old nesting material um, so that the birds can build a, a new one. So. I, but imagine that's what most birds do is they're actually just building a new one each year, but. Um, yeah, but they definitely, if they find a place they like. Yeah, and like bigger birds, like osprey and eagles, they'll go back to the same nest because it takes so long for them to build those things. Those are like huge structures. Well, they'll definitely reuse nests. Um, yeah. There was a comment that um, someone had a tree that for 40 years they had squirrels in the same kind of holes in the trees. Nice. So that makes sense. They they found somewhere they liked. <laughs> Do you have any comments on controlling groundhogs? Well, we have a fact sheet on our website. If you go to wildlife.ruckers.edu and go to our fact sheets and publications page, um, we have a fact sheet we put out last year. Um, there's all sorts of management advice for groundhogs. Um, but yeah, best, best thing to do is just protect your most valuable areas. So if you have a garden or something that you highly value and you don't want groundhogs, um, we describe a type of fencing that you could put in that would really keep out any animal, uh, but it involves burying the fence about six to 12 inches and then um, putting it out, uh, putting the fence like in an L shape underground so that anything trying to burrow under would hit the fence underground. They, they wouldn't be able to get in. OK. Um, deer droppings. Um, do you know anything about why they're sometimes wet and sometimes dry pellets? <laughs> um, no. I think it's just based on what they're eating um but i've noticed that too there's a they're highly variable in their consistency um i don't know why i think it's just diet related okay i actually think we're almost through all the questions um there's a comment that robins do renest in the same nest year after year cool And one question was, what's required to be a wildlife rehabber? Um, I believe you have to get your license through the state. And I, I don't know what those requirements are to get licensed, um, but there's definitely a process to go through. Um, and I think it's just so that they make sure that the people taking in the wildlife you know, know what they're doing and they're equipped to handle it. Um, but yeah, that's probably something you could look up on the state website. Okay, I think I'm gonna call that all the questions. Okay. Hopefully I got to everyone's, everyone's questions.
And of course, I'd like to thank Kathleen for being with us tonight. Thank you. Uh, actually, a really fascinating <laughs> conversation about baby animals, stuff I don't often think about. Um, I guess, honestly, I worry more about dead animals that <laughs> crop up in the property, but <laughs> that could be a whole nother presentation. I yeah, guess. there you go. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. So let me let me turn off the recording at this point. <laughs>